Hey, Jeff Straw here from Pure Mind. Uh, we're excited to have JJ with us from Shifted Music, among other incredible labels over the years. He's going to join us for an elite session right after this, and I thought I'd kick things off with a little chat to talk about his history in the business, as well as uh, a lot of the music he's put out over the years. So with that, let's get right into it, man. So let's start at the beginning. When you got into DJing and producing, you know, it was a very different world back then. Mm -hmm. Talk about kind of what drew you to the art and to the, you know, to getting into the clubs and DJing in the first place. Well, ultimately it was the music. I mean, I was just enamored by this sound, uh, the, the early, early stages of house music in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, you know, interestingly, back then the, the clubs were more varied in sound. Like you would hear uh, multiple genres through the course of the night. But nonetheless, it was just the culture and everything just sort of drew me in. And uh, I had been DJing and was learning to DJ when I was younger and, and in high school and DJ at a roller skating rink. And then in college, started working and DJing and had like a radio show and started going out a lot and, and just, yeah, just continued from there. And a few years later, um, got inter interested in producing music. And I had played guitar when I was younger and done recording when I was younger and dealt with a lot of audio and stuff for years. And it was just sort of a natural progression to start to like put together gear and start to make music and started doing that in the mid 90s, or early 90s also. And, and um, just kept doing it. I mean, you know, it was like, I just, <laughs> all of a sudden it was like years later went from that to then owning studios and just selling studios and working <laughs> in studios and work, you know just gear collecting like crazy and computer geek and everything that came with it you know nice nice and um yeah just the music ultimately is what drew me in so you predate computer recording right by a, a decent amount of time or you um, early computer a little bit was it was early setup like? yeah it was early computers actually okay. um so like the first studio well, I mean, when it came to me making house music, we had an old Mac computer that was running the MIDI. Um, the board was still, you know, analog and um, drum machines, keyboards and synthesizers were all uh, being triggered by the MIDI. So we would program stuff in Performer which mm -hmm. before it was digital Performer. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I had like four track cassette recorders and would do stuff through the late 80s and, and early 90s. but. Um, when I got into house music in the mid-90s, uh, 93, 94, I guess, we, we had, you know, computer-driven stuff. So at that point, a lot of my friends were sequencer-driven, and a couple were computer-driven. Um, Studio Vision was one of the early programs. Performer was, was there. And soon came Digital Performer, where now you had access to actually digital audio in there, which was like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, just, yeah, so... Grew from there. It's the early, yeah. Nice, mm -hmm. nice. So while we're in the early days still, who, who were some of your influences? You know, you mentioned the music is what got you into it. So mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got some house music influences. And outside of house music and electronic music, who were mm -hmm. some of your big, like, go-to? I think back in the day in San Francisco, late, late 80s, early 90s, I was going to these, you know, clubs and listening to guys like Buck and Noel uh, Jelly Bear, Jerry Ross were some of these guys that were playing a lot around town and at the you know clubs that are still there today or different names or whatever. Well, 1015 still has the same name, but you know DV8 back then is now called Temple and you know uh, Club Love that was my first residency in San Francisco. That's now a Denny's or something like that, you know. But <laughs> you know I would go to these things and and. Um, uh, you know, sort of would see these people. And Yano and Garth were playing a lot back then as well. And Doc Martin also uh, was one of my early influences in terms of, like, the club scene as that started to get going in the early 90s. And, um, so you guys are all kind of feeding off each other then. You contemporaries, like, pushing the boundaries with each other, starting to come up in the scene. Fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a few years later before I got to, like, a recognizable basis with some of those guys. Got it, okay. Um, you know, certainly through the 90s in the record stores, I was, I had a lot of momentum as a local DJ, was playing a lot, and would then from there would start to got to know the, you know, Yano and Garth and Buck and Noel and those guys. Right, right. But, you know, I would be like, I would show up on Sunday nights to church on the top floor at DV8, and that was like Yano and Buck and Noel and Corey and a bunch of guys. And I would uh, just go and hang out in the booth. And the first time there, it was like, I 
kind of made my way into the booth at some point when someone opened the booth door or whatever and kind of hung out there, didn't know anybody, didn't talk to anybody, and then did it again another week and another week. And then by then it was like, I guess he's supposed to be here. And I would just <laughs> listen to what they were doing, whatever, and then eventually like say hi because they saw me there every week. And, and I just would show up alone and I would just hang out, whatever. And then, awesome. you know, years later it was like, or I don't know, maybe it wasn't years later, but at least a year or so later, it was like I would then sort of talk to them a little bit. And and then, and, you know, and then I was like asked to play there once because they saw me there all the time. And then they would story. probably then saw me at the record store also, whatever, right, right. And, you know. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I would just go and just listen to these people and man. stuff, you know. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Ugh. I still go out alone today most of the time. Like, right. you know, and I'll I'll see people obviously that I know when I'm out, but it's not uncommon for me to just sort of walk up by myself or something I, somebody I want to see and somewhere I want to go and I'm still just as much a fan of this music as I was back then. I mean, that's the interesting thing for me is like I love house music just like the best of them, you know, and everyone else out there. So, um it's always fun for me to, you know, to do that and it's interesting when I interact with people and they are always like you know, talking to me like after my gigs or whatever, like, oh, you know, I love your music. I'm a fan of yours or whatever. And I've always looked at that as like, you know, that that's really cool because we now have something in common. So I've always felt like there's this camaraderie when people say, I love your music. It's like, well, me too. Like, these are my favorite songs. And if you like them, then we have something in common. We have similar taste in music. So you must be kind of cool or at least a dork like me and in some way that we can relate because we share the same t taste in music. And, um, you know, really I still love that. that. Yeah, I've never I've really, really looked at it like they're fan, like right. whatever. Like you're not a fan of me. You're a fan of like my favorite music, just like I am. Like that's really cool. we're the same in that regard. Like, that's, that's great. so, um, yeah, so that's. So, so like speaking that, of today, so, so mm -hmm. who, who, who are you listening to today that's new? Kind of some of the new hotness in, in your record bag. You know, I'm like, that's just always all over the board for me. But um, but I think um, I like, I mean, you know, look, Guest House, local label, I feel like consistently they've just been some of the most consistent, fun music that I love. Lots of disco influence stuff, lots of energy behind the music. So it's stuff that can be played pretty regularly. And, you know, other people that have become my boys. I'm a fan of Salted and Miguel Miggs. And, like, you know, we're now, like, great friends for years and years. And But yet I'm still, I still love what he does. And yeah. um, I think there's a lot of the new people that I enjoy um, their stuff, too. Um, and some of it is, like... Some of it, sometimes I'm just into the sound for the production value. Like it might not necessarily be something I play or whatever, but like I really like that stuff that EDX does, especially when he does stuff that's like more similar to like the house that I like. But his production quality is always like so good and um, the sound choices are always so good. Uh, the groovier stuff, I like the hot creations, you know, sort of sound and then the, the really sort of stripped down laid back disco stuff. Um, you know, it's it's really similar to a lot of the stuff that sort of became this San Francisco sound that was, you know, born out of the people I was working with in my studio and, and all that. It's, it's sort of like, it's really come like this full circle, like this sort of naked music San Francisco sound of the, of the early 2000s is, you know, similar to this sort of like UK bred hot creations, kind of slowed down, mellow, disco, funky, soulful kind of thing with uh, groove oriented and stuff so you know i like that stuff as well it's, it's you know certainly stuff i've always enjoyed so this you know and it's, a lot of times it's just a track by track basis i'll just somehow vibe with something that somebody did specifically and um it's always hard for me to like nail that down to like a you know a guy that i like or whatever um and I, i've never been one of those djs that has that amazing like song memory either right like and i've always actually felt really like out of place like if i get in that group where those guys are talking about old disco records right. by name right. by year and by who produced it and stuff and i'm like i don't know I what the cover looks like <laughs> that's know. how i used to flip man you know, i know the cover oh that's yeah. the one exactly yeah digital's hard like the, right because like you don't the get the, you don't yeah. have a flip yeah anyways enough yeah. about me um <laughs> so talk about you did the record with latrice and cascade for ultra mm -hmm. this was a few years back now but yeah, like yeah. Clearly, Cascade is one of the biggest names in the mm -hmm, business yeah, today. Yeah. Latrice has certainly made a name for herself as a just stunning vocalist. What was that like co-producing with him, and what was the dynamic like in the studio? Just talk a little yeah, bit about that. Yeah, you know, that. it was it was really fun. We um, 
conceptually, we we chatted about this idea, and he was like, you know, hey, we were thinking of, you know, wanting to use Latrice and do some stuff, some singles or whatever, and then, you know, we said, well, what if we were to, you know, sort of work together on on something, and and then we came up with this concept that was like, all right, well, look, I've got a bunch of stuff lying around. Let me go through that and make some of these tracks take shape a little bit. And then you can listen to that and kind of pick from that. And then you do the same. And then we ended up passing stuff back and forth. So mm-hmm. I, ha- you know, basically half of the album I started, half of the album they started. And then we would sort of like, okay, cool, yeah, I dig that. And they would send me the session and then I would like whatever, like work with a guitar player or redo some drums or add to it in one way or another. And they would do the same. And then and then once we had a decent group of stuff, we then, you know, brought in Latrice and was like, okay, well, what do you think? And, and then started the writing process of nice. like bouncing ideas back and forth. And, um, and it was done at this time when I was... I was just about to sell my studio here and I was spending a lot of time in New York and I was going back and forth and setting up my studio in New York and and um, and then, you know, coming back here and we would meet here, but I would work on stuff there and they would work on stuff in L.A. and Salt Lake City and, where, you know, where their, you know, studios are. And, um, and we just sort of, like, would start to make these things take shape and then we did... It, it, we did a whole bunch of it in over the course of like two weeks and I had just had moved to New York and like a week later I flew back here and actually was like staying in a hotel <laughs> and working out of my old studio that had just been sold and it was new people that were taking it over but um, we were in there and then we had you know Miguel's room was right down the hall and he was like traveling on, on tour or whatever so I was like coordinating with him and was like using his room for stuff and would do, had keyboard players in there and, you know, writing sessions in there while my room was going and recording vocals and we were running back and forth and, <laughs> and you know, just, you know, getting all this stuff going and here for, you know, 16, 17 hours a day and a couple times crashing on the couch and just working, 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 working to make it happen. And, um, you know, so it was fun to do it like that. And, you know, the concept was cool because it was, we were able to start with more than just like scratch. It wasn't like we all sat in the studio and said, okay, what kind of beat do we want now? It was like they had ideas, I had ideas, and then we just started making it happen. And so within a few months, we actually had this album done. That's awesome. Um, and we were all working on other things at the same time. So it really wasn't a few months worth of work. It was less than that, but it was pretty mayhem when we were all together. <laughs> nice, man. Nice. Uh, cool. Well, how about we talk about your time with Defected, and I, I my, my question was, what was your biggest selling mix CD? And, and mm-hmm. I already knew the answer, because you did the, yeah. some stuff with Defected, and cl- clearly they've been a huge player in the scene for a long time. So how, yeah. how did that, you know, quickly kind of go over, how did that deal come to come to play, and then what did that mm-hmm. do for you as the, the yeah. JJ brand, having Defected behind you? Yeah, I mean, they were arguably one of the biggest house labels, certainly the biggest um, independent house label. At that time, there were major house labels. Um, or at least that were under the umbrella of majors that Mm -hmm, had mm -hmm. major marketing and big money, especially in the UK. And, um, you know, Simon Dunmore from Defected had come from a major and started this independent uh, label, but with a major mentality. So Mm -hmm. he was signing big records, putting money behind it, marketing, getting remixes done, putting, uh, you know, some serious push behind singles and and albums and stuff. And uh, at that time, that was in the, you know, early 2000, maybe 2000 or 99, 2000, something right around there. And we certainly were, uh, had a lot of momentum out here with uh, the music that was happening and what we were doing. And um, he just basically, well, he, he had uh, signed Keep On Rising, which was a single I did with Latrice. And uh, from that, he was like, hey, you know, we're thinking of doing this um this mix compilation, would you would you guys be down to do that? A double, you know, double mix CD with, with the two of you, me and Miguel, and um, coinciding with the single. And then um, I think there was another single also that was on that CD. I can't remember how that went down, but it was like, you know, let's sort of put this together and use them both to market each other. And we had a lot of momentum with the sound and the music that was happening at this with the studio at, at the time and stuff I was doing and stuff I was doing with Miguel and that Miguel was doing and that I was doing with Chris Lum and mm-hmm. you know different people and so we did that the very first in the house CD their their the first compilation for them uh, 
the in the house, which has become a massive brand with you know pretty yeah. much the who's who of house music is done in the house. I didn't CD realize you guys were the first one. We were the first that's, one. That's that was cool. it. Yeah, the blue one. Everyone always says, "Oh, the, he's the listening to your blue CD, the one with Miguel." Because you know. um, he had already done a lot of the naked music series at that point, right? He so did he was one naked off... music CD okay. at, by that point. Oh, okay, their he went compilation back to do quite a few more with them. Not quite a few, but at least a couple. More he did another them. mix CD and he did an album. Right. Okay. That's um, what it was. Yeah. So sweet. Yeah. So that was how that went down yeah and so then there was the, a few more singles and then i did another compilation with them um a few years later that was like a three disc compilation where we had a bunch of my unreleased stuff that they were able to license cool so i had some stuff that was like kind of like edits that i had done or you know bootlegs as they call it whatever like stuff that i'd done just to to play and um you know and they were able to license some of that uh, which was really dope, so that those got, like, official releases, like Alicia Keys mix and the Jill Scott mix and a couple other, like, you know, Coffee Brown remixes and things that I did, like, with, with guys here, you know, Chris Lum and I did one, and um, uh, David Harness and I did another one, and, you know, we just would mess around in the studio with stuff that we wanted to play, and they actually licensed that for real and put it on that the connected CD, which, which was fun to do. We had some music videos on that CD as well, oh, so nice. that was kind of cool. But yeah, anyway, yeah. So talk about running, you know, you've worked with every, I have a list here, but I'm not even going to read it out, because you've worked with so many labels over the years, like the who's who of house labels. But you've also been running a pretty successful label for, I don't know how long, years now, mm -hmm. as yeah. Shifted Music. Yeah. Predominantly to put out your own stuff. Yeah. Uh, talk about the kind of philosophy behind Shifted, how you A&R remixes, how you A&R, you know, incoming other artists to put out and... Yeah, What's so your philosophy there? it basically um, it got to the point where I had uh, a bunch of material that I liked and that I wanted to put out, and I was moving from San Francisco. Had sold the studio, was moving to New York, and sort of launched this new sort of production name slash label and, and everything with with shifted music. I was at a point in my life where that name was significant because my whole life was being shifted up, like, and that's where the name of cool. my remixes comes from, like, because, you know, there was, um, you know, relationship ending, business ending, and changing, and uh, moving a place I'd lived in San Francisco for 18 years, my whole, you know, adult life, and was moving to New York, and everything was just, like, being you shifted. know shifted mm -hmm. and uh and i you know i definitely looked at it as a very you know positive time and a fun thing it wasn't a negative thing it just everything was changing everything was was shifting up so um i just basically started to you know put out stuff you know songs that i liked and um had i had a multiple single deal with ultra after the the album we did with latrice and um had given them a version of a song that a new song with Latrice and they didn't think it was going to work for their label and so I used that as the starting point for mine and then just kind of followed it up with stuff that I liked and stuff that I wanted to put out um, and then from there after being you know around and having colleagues a all over the world and and be people that I knew for a really long time and had uh, appreciated their music it was easy to sort of like network with a few people and say hey you know are you down to like do a trade like you know I can finance this label off of my talent and history and trade for you and you get something cool for me and I get something cool from you and have this whole barter thing going and nice. we just had tons of remixes swapping back and forth and and everything and just yeah just continued to kind of like not necessarily tie it to any specific sound, but just stuff that I liked and wanted to put out. And, you know, as the industry finances got less and less in terms of labels offering advances and stuff, I was like, well, why don't I just put it out myself? It's like, if there's not really a lot of economics in it, I might as well at least push it myself and be proud of stuff that I, that I want, right. you know? So, um, yeah, so it's worked out. It's pretty fun. I'm just a little creative outlet nice, to do man. whatever. I think we're about out of time, so good shot with you, my brother. Cool. Always good to see you. You too. Thanks for having Stick me. Stick around. We've got the Elite yeah. Session coming up next. very much like to thank Pyramid for hosting me here once again. Um, I think this institution is really cool and until I came here for the first time I had never seen anything like it in my whole life. What I think really separates us 
from other people who teach is that we are outrageously passionate about what we do, and especially in electronic music. Since since coming to Pyramind, I, I've discovered electronic music, and you know, San Francisco being a mecca for underground electronic music opened up so many doors for me and kind of blew my mind. We cover everything from absinthe to contact. When people get to the mind-melting level, uh, we get into modular synthesis. Everything about native instruments, everything about logic synths, down to the, the finest detail, we, we learned it all. The fundamentals of understanding how things work, that's just essential. But then beyond that, there's so much more, and that's where it gets into just a lot of, of the artistic side of like, the creative approach of, of why you do something, not just how. There's a lot of schools that just, you know, they focus on the technicality of, of recording music, um, but I wanted something that would foster creativity and, and really help me develop as an artist as well. Each of our genre-specific programs comes in four levels. There's a basic, an advanced, a professional, and then a master's level. And the master's level is, of course, everything we do. It's the largest and most powerful programs that we can create for you.